Welcome everyone and welcome to the Inside the Box lecture series. Once again, this semester we're focusing on performing Inside the Box and we have an amazing treat today. Someone really, really well known. Have you heard of the Rockwell Group? They're like the best firm on the planet and we have Barry Richards who has his own studio within the Rockwell Group with us today. And I'm going to, he, there's so many things I need to say that I'm actually going to read it, so excuse me for reading this to tell you about Barry. Barry Richards is a principal and studio leader at Rockwell Group, where he brings his multifaceted skill set to work. Projects include the Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta and Walt Disney Family Museum, the Breakthrough Imagination Playground Initiative, Capital One Cafe prototypes, as well as leading product design for a host of high-end collections with Knoll, The Rug Company, Bizaza, Stellar Works, Rich Brilliant Willing, Maya Romanoff, Jim Thompson, Jesse, and Shaw Hospitality Group. Barry is well known for his set design for film, television, and theater, including the 2009 and 2010 Academy Awards the film Team America, World Police, and many critically acclaimed Broadway shows, including Hairspray and Catch Me If You Can. His designs for high profile special events include those for the annual Design Industries Foundation Fighting AIDS event, and you know we participated in last year's AIDS event, and, and Barry and the Rockwell Group are they're, they're every year, of which Rockwell Group is a um, perennial contributor. I could just go on for hours about Barry, and I was lucky to meet Barry personally in Sweden last year at the Furniture Fair, and you will be delighted. I want to let you know I have two books that will be out for you from the Rockwell Group. There's another book in my office which I'll bring to you called Pleasure that Barry worked on. And so if we can welcome Barry. Thank you very much. Uh, I should have paid more attention to when Carol asked me, could I you know, speak in front of her class? I said, sure, I'd speak in front of a class. I should have realized and put more attention to it. It's a lecture series. And, but I'm really happy to be here. Um, my name is Barry. I'm in, trained as an architect, but I've done interior design, product design, theater design. I have been incredibly fortunate that I've kind of crossed over multi of dimensions of, in the design world. And so today I'm just going to try to take you through some of our projects and connect you to the ideas to the final project. And um, so it's not just, hopefully not just a collection of pretty pictures. We're about 35 years old. Um, we have uh, six studios, five here in New York City. We're on Union Square. One studio is in Madrid. We're about 220 people. We're a mix of interior designers and architects. Our focus is on interior architecture. Uh, we do some stand-up, uh, ground-up buildings, but pretty much it's the interior architecture that we focus on. And hospitality probably drives our business. And so for us, it's really about paying attention to what's the trends. You know, these are our current trends that are affecting our markets. You know, for us, these are trends and things that are happening and changes, changes that are happening. But for you, it's probably life. You know, for us, it's the trends and things are different, but you live them, but you know, it's clearly we're in a, a, a different world from when I went to school. Um, we're more of an experience economy. Uh, that's, the big, that's sort of the biggest change and informs a lot of what we do in terms of our work. I think, you, uh, in fact, talk, I talk to students, and they say, oh, I'm designing this experience now. So it's become a part of our vocabulary. Technology continually changes and informs everything. We have viral brands. Social reviews inform like how we like look at things. There's the socializer in, in the exhibit world. We like to talk about there's the streaker, the scholar, and the studier, and but there's now the socializer. It's, a, it's sort of a, a user group. You know, wherever you can take a picture, wherever you take a selfie. Uh, there's a lot of, of course now designs to kind of accommodate that and experiences to accommodate that. You can work anywhere and everywhere. Um, globalization. You know, flexibility, transformation are key to what we do now. That's really making things easy to change, easy to shift. Um, and the real, a lot of it's coming about because, you know, millennials are in and boomers are, um, are on the way out. And so it's a real um, seismic shift in sort of the demographics of 
who we're designing for and who are the users, a little bit more local. So these are kind of some of the trends that we pay attention to. Um, but I also think a big, a big trend is it used to be separate markets. You designed for restaurants, you designed for hotels that was very different from designing for the workplace. High-rise residential was another separate um, field. They all had different designers, different ways of uh, working. Residential, healthcare, retail, all are, were separate endeavors. But I think there's now a merging where everything is coming together in that sort of Venn diagram where hospitality, workplace, and high-rise residential, healthcare, retail are all converging. And the one that's um, infiltrating this is hospitality. People want that hospitality experience. They want a place that feel comfortable, they feel warm. Um, I think this really comes from a place of, when we designed this, we started designing 35 years ago. David Rockwell started and working restaurants. And he talked to the chef and he talked to the chef, what was the style of service like? What was the food like? And he wanted the experience in the restaurant to resemble that and be a part of that. And so he really, what we did back then, I think we even called them theme restaurants, is a lot of experiences, unique experiences that you couldn't have in other places. And I think that experience kind of design that you have started off in really in these intense and immersive environments that were restaurants has expanded then to hotels, which used to be very you know, kind of comfortable and like more stayed, but now also are driven by experience. So that hospitality experience is really w w sort of the type of experience that people want in workplace and other markets as well. But a space needs to be more pretty. It needs to be an experience that you really want to be in. Uh, one way you can kind of find what we do now a little bit is uh, social mining. You know, looking up uh, through social reviews. Because you really want to do some research. You want to not you want your um, project to be based on ideas and reasons. And so sometimes like social reviews can give you a insight to kind of what people are like, what they're looking for, what are the needs in these spaces. And I think that came about, that comes about in sort of thinking about design differently than when I was in school. So rather than thinking about just destinations, you know, I'm going to the ballroom, I'm going to the, the different spaces, the lobby, well, what are the need states in each of those. What do you need? When you arrive at reception, what do you need? What are the sort of, what information do you need? How do you support the activity that's happening there? Um, so rather than zoning and bubble diagramming, thinking about rituals. Rituals connect you to a space. In fact, you know, um, a group of people through a group of individual um, rituals connect to spaces more completely as a community. I think we also think about, in a sort of whole performance idea, choreography becomes important. Not just you know, the sequence, but what is the choreography? How do you slow down? How do you speed up? In fact, we had a choreographer help us with when we did the JetBlue terminal. So think about not just you know, the sequence of how you, how you get from one place to another, circulation. Think about the number of people. Think about you know, this kind of the dance that is involved in all of our movement. And we're fortunate to be in New York City which is where the biggest dance happens all the time. We're always constantly maneuvering. There's a choreography of the street. There's a choreography of the experience that is very urban and in New York. And so I think we have then there's this, you know, instead of individual users and accommodate them, we now think of groups of people, sort of an experienced community. And you are connected through your kind of experiences or your, your, your spaces through the sort of shared experiences that you have in a, as a community. And as, at Rockwell Group, we're known for a lot of our um, hospitality work, um, but we do have some ground-up buildings. Um, we do retail. We also do um, theater work, as the Oscars, long-term playgrounds, interactives. We have a lab dedicated in our studio for um, interactives, for creating uh, technology, technology interactives and spaces that are embedded into our architecture. And then we have um, some strategy. So I'll show you some hospitality work that we're known for. Um, so we create these places and experiences that people love. And I think that's, you know, they come to hospitality, they want um, designers that are focused on hospitality because they really want those experiences that help drive people to spaces they, people, that people connect to. And then they also um, write about on social media. This is um, the Magic Hour at Moxie Times Square. It's uh, based on a carnival, so the whole idea of a carnival on the rooftop. And there's a merry-go-round banquette. Um, so it's kind of a real immersive experience. It's fun. 
it's popular, it's filled with people at, at night, but it's, it's, it's a unique experience that is um, for that particular hotel, Moxie Times Square. We're also doing Moxie Chelsea and then Moxie East Village. So each hotel comes to us to create a unique uh, choreographed experience and that's unique and, for, and bespoke to them. Uh, this is Nobu. Uh, we've, done, we've worked with Nobu probably over the last 25, 30 years. We did the, design their first flagship restaurant. And we went to a landmark space downtown when they lost their lease and was to create in this sort of landmark space, how do you kind of bring their, the essence, which is um, Nobu Matsuhita's um, food service to that space without um, damaging the architecture. And so what we did is we looked at the Sumi brushstroke, the spontaneous nature of the Sumi brushstroke, and created a uh, dimensional wood carving that sort of floats in the space. And then everything in here is flexible and can move so the whole space can become, go back to its um, original state. And we also just did Moxie Chelsea, a series of venues and different restaurant spaces. And there's like three restaurant spaces, another rooftop. It's all very fun, very immersive. Um, the Union Square Cafe, um, again, another restaurant that we've done. It was a um, famous restaurant in Union Square. People loved it, and they, they decided to move. They were said, how could you move? It's an institution. So we did a number of techniques to kind of connect it back to its original um, place to give the same character and feel, <coughs> even though it's a much different space. It's, two, it's double story. The original height was the height of these lamps right here. So it connects back to that. The length of the bar is the same length of the bar that was a signature in the first, in the first restaurant. They brought over the same artwork. Um, the color, dark green, is from the same restaurant, the corbels. So we used the very first restaurant to inform the work that we did in this sort of upgrade in the last couple of years. Uh, we do, you know, as you can see, all of the hotel spaces you know, are very different from, from type to type, from brand to brand. That's because everyone wants a unique space. This is very residential, high-end addition in Madison Square Park. And it has a signature stair that brings you up to um, the Clock Tower restaurant. And we also make space where people feel comfortable, welcome. Um, Nobu Barcelona, we've taken the brand of Nobu and translated it from restaurant into living spaces and hotel spaces. And what does that mean? It means a lot of craft, unique spaces, and creating Kind of the same brush stroke that we used in the space becomes part of the carpet, becomes part of the signature there, and crafted elements to create that sort of warm, comfortable space. This is Andaz, which is in, um, in Hawaii, and the whole living room is outdoors, and this, it's a sand pit. So you walk into a living room, and it sort of begins the experience from the very first when you walk in to reception of a sand and the beach as a part of your overall experience. And they also, this is where people spend time together. So as an outgrowth of our work in hospitality, we've gone to do um, nightclubs, big nightclubs in Las Vegas. This is Aria. It has this large dimensional interactive light piece that comes down in different rings <coughs> with a chandelier in the center. And it does a couple things. It transforms the space. You know, there's 3,000 people. makes it incredibly active. It starts at 11 o'clock with um, EDM. Um, DJs coming on and this also when it, it's a slower night and the mezzanine is not fully packed it brings it down and changes the scale of the space and we work with brands to create new perspectives you know we work with uh, Shinola it's a American brand watch company and create their first retail space to focus on their bikes their watches their leather goods to create a, a very unique experience and there we used a lot of um, artifacts that come from and try to create the whole space as an artifact. This was a vintage map of the world and then all custom casework that allows uh, to focus on the kind of craftsmanship that is um, part of the Shinola brand. And another place where we really looked to reinvent this, this was Capital One. Capital One came to us. Um, who goes to bank anymore? No one wants to go to bank. People you know, don't carry cash as much. So how do you bring people back in to encourage them to like for checking. And this was a marrying the idea of a coffee shop with um, a bank branch. So it's like a bank, a coffee bank. And so it has a, a number of different experiences. It has a community room, so you can have lectures and talks, so people can get together. 
but it really is about creating a coffee shop that, where you can go and hang out, have a good cup of coffee, Pete's Coffee. So it wants to look like a place you'd go to, you'd hang out, and you get Wi-Fi, and then there's ability to connect with an associate if you want to, and an ATM. So really looking at how to reimagine what a bank might be in today's day and age when people are looking for you to spend less time in a bank. And then um, theater. Our, our heart and our passion is in theater. David Rockwell, my boss, loves theater. And about uh, 15 years ago, he said, would, would, you help, would I help him on a show? Our first show was Rocky Horror Show. He had always gone to the theater. His good friends were in the theater. And they said, one of them said, don't just be in the audience. You should be a part and a participant in this. So he's been, we've been doing um, probably a couple shows a year, maybe sometimes three or four. And we've probably done over 60 shows um, on Broadway, tours, and um, nationwide. So here's a, a whole range of things. Sideshow, Kinky Boots, All Shook Up. Our first show was Rocky Horror. I worked on this and this show. I worked on Omni and Gatherum, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Hairspray. So a lot of this, and it informs what we do. It's sort of you know this idea of theatricality, you know, kind of um, embeds the experience in a much more dramatic way, gives a little more focus. And this is Hairspray, um, the first big. We are, this is our second big big musical on Broadway. The first one was Rocky Horror. And it's really how do you bring that movie come to life? Um, we spoke to John Waters, did a lot of research in Brooklyn um, and uh, Baltimore. And the back is, I don't know if anyone remembers, a light bright toy. Uh, we based some of the things on toys the 60s, can candy the 60s. So this was meant to resemble a light bright toy, which is little pegs that go into a, a light box that are colored to create different views. And it was like a, a, one of the first interactive kind of walls that can animate itself. So it, during the, um, this one song, Welcome to the 60s, it comes to life and the set becomes almost a character in the show. This is at the end of the show, the big finale. And it's a big hairspray. It's made of um, seven miles of surgical rubber, rubber tubing. The bangs here, in fact, were the bottom of the, the, uh, the curtain, the show curtain went up and down. So it lifted up, became the bangs, this big, the droopy part. And then we flew in the kind of flip curls on the left and the right. This is um, uh, She Loves Me, classic uh, musical. This is one where David, won, David Rockwell won the uh, Tony for. And it's a sort of classic musical that all the action takes place in Budapest and on the streets and inside this, inside this little perfume shop. So we, what we created was a little jewel box, a little jewel box that opens up and you can see, or see the inside of the shop. So it, that's one thing that's very important with um, theaters is to be very fluid. The transition from scene to scene is just as important as the scene itself. So you have to spend as much time on like how does it move from one scene to the other scene. Uh, and knowing like when we design, we always get focused on what does it look like? How do we make that look good? But here you have to kind of break up all your notions of you know, what, is, what things should look like because you're thinking fluidly in, in choreography and musicality so it can shift from scene to scene. And that's we did. Uh, we were lucky to do the Oscars um, for a couple of years, and they wanted to make it more. It's all most of it is video, a lot of it's um, taped pre beforehand, and they wanted to create a much more dynamic, on, like live on stage kind of effects. So we pushed the theater out, the stage out. We added some crystals to the overall piece, and it's a, there's a hundred thousand Swarovski crystals. And let me tell you, you can't go wrong with a hundred thousand Swarovski crystals. <laughs> Every time you come in and out of the commercial, it just lights up, it glows, it's pretty, it was pretty amazing. It took two days to hang those all up. They put them on a rod and they would lift them up and then keep on hanging them over two days. And this year we did like, um, the idea was LA Glamour, you know, classic LA Glamour. You know, use a lot of drape, you know, entrances, things that moved around, the bands on stage. Creating, and in the house too, we created custom lights that hung inside the, th um, the auditorium. And you can see down, looking down at the, at the set, all this is kind of a part of the overall design. So it's not just on stage, it's animated into the theater itself so that the house itself becomes a part of the environment and the focus. And this was the kind of view that came in and out of the commercial. 
And we also do auditoriums, theaters. This is for the TED, TED Talks. They moved from Long Beach and they're, they want a temporary theater that could last you know, for the um, four days of the, their conference. And so this gets set, set up in three days. It's all temporary. It's in about an 80,000 square foot, 60,000 square foot banquets, uh, banquet hall. And it gets set up. Each of these are individually numbered pieces of wood that can be assembled in three days. And since you're sp spending all the time, TED is less about a performance than about um, networking, participation, listening to the different TED Talks. So there is multiple ways of seating here. There is beanbag chairs. There is um, lounge seating that's close up. There's some regular seats over here. There's 16 different types of seating so that you can kind of choose the way you want to sit. It's like, why should you have to sit in the same kind of chair um, for like five, six hours? People need to like get up, move around, socialize, because that's just as much as some part of it. The bloggers actually sat in the back and had um, desks along here. And so it's really mixed up, so it allows a, um, a different experience than a, a show that has the beginning to the middle to the end. And we just did the Helen Hayes, upgraded this um, by <coughs> respecting the kind of original architecture space, but then taking from one of the earlier kind of tapestries and putting a digital print all over the walls. And this is a new project, The Shed. Uh, we worked with the Diller Skip Video Renfro to create an, uh, a new major public space in New York City. It's the first new major space in decades. Um, this is a retractable cover, so it comes back into this tower here. So this space could be indoors or outdoors. These are on big wheels that are about a ton of piece. They could track. And so it's a warehouse for the arts. So there's a series of spaces. You can have you know, fashion catwalks in here. You can have musical performances. Anything that could kind of happen, you can be in. Um, um, it's very flexible and can transform into a whole range of pieces. We just had a birthday party for Jose Andreas, and we helped him create a birthday party in that space. And this would be this would be an animation that would show it kind of moving out and then coming back in, sort of a, um, and how the whole thing works. And as I said before, uh, uh, early part of this that there's now a collision of the different types of market and design. People never used to come to us for workplace, you know, the offices. That was always a different firm. It was the Genslers of the world. And people now want that same hospitality experience in their workplace. They want to feel as warm, as comfortable as you might in a hotel lobby. And in fact, you go to an Ace Hotel or a lot of hotels that, you know, look at. And, you know, it's lobby by day and then it's club at night. So there's that ability to transform from one space to the other that's really also important when you uh, in workplace. Uh, because you're not only working individually, you're working collaboratively, you're working in teams. So one of the pieces we are you know, designing spaces that you know, accommodate this you know, a sense of affordances. Of we, we're supporting much like we did in the theater work. We're supporting a narrative, a, a story, and activities that, in these spaces rather than just making it look good or functional. And this is Cornell Tech. Uh, it's a temporary space, so it's really about creating a flexible, can, a whole thing can open up or close down to create classroom spaces or workspaces. And so like the idea of transformation, much like a set, can open up or close down and become you know, a stage and a setting for different activities and experiences. Uh, we also designed, this is a few years now, Noy House. And they wanted to bring into the co-working space um, a much more social, much more food and beverage oriented, which is like uh, classic hospitality, like hotel lounges. And we have like a little bleacher seating here that becomes both a theater, much like this place here. You can have performances. You also have um, food and beverage um, cafe right here. So the whole first floor is all lounge. And then the upper floors are a mixture of lounge spaces and um, work, work desks and little partitions. So you can actually work into the, because people like to work in lounge spaces, like get together. Um, have meetings out here, and then also go back and work individually. Uh, we also did one in another Noy house in California, in Hollywood. This is the old CPS Studios, so it's the same studio where Lucille Ball filmed her sitcom. And again, they're creating spaces out of the studio stage, big event spaces that can transform into multiple activities and events, lounge space, um, 
cafe space. I think what happens in workplace now, it's both centered on eating, drinking, how people get together and work, as well as technology. Um, we also did, this is down on Union Square, just overlooking um, the park. And Shaw came to us, wanted to create a, a new showroom that was focused on their product, but also felt like a very New York space. And this did most of the work. It was an incredible view. You got to look straight in the park, a view that I never really saw before. And we wanted to create a variety of different settings, you know, both that people can come in and work. And we convinced them that they should create a space that doesn't showcase their product, but it is a place that is aspirational and it should look like and resemble the, the workplaces that their designers are coming to do. So rather than looking like a classic showroom, it wants to look like an office that the designers will be working in and has a variety of different places to sit down and meet with clients. Such as this, we, um, as I said, the food and beverage is very important. So it's a kitchen that's very open. It's part of this. Um, people can come, come up the bar and get something to drink there. There's like a kitchen table. There's a big uh, long conference table over here. So it has that variety of places that people, the way you sit, the way you come to the table is all, um, becomes different and allows you to work differently according to your needs. This is William Morris Agency. Um, they represent a lot of people, including chefs. So in their space, they have a demo kitchen right in the center of their offices. Um, so it allows people, again, to another focus, a big experience that makes you unique, ties it together, creates a series of different sort of spaces or conference rooms surrounded by mesh curtains, um, very raw and open, with a lot of artwork they collected, very eclectic, allowing kind of a, um, a sort of eclectic expression of their brand as well. This we just finished is the Warner Music Group. Uh, they wanted, it's in LA, and it's an old Ford factory that was converted. And they want to bring all five of their different music brands together in one space. Each of them compete with each other, each of them are antagonistic. So the, the, this idea is a, a performance space where people can come together and all the brands can kind of participate in one major performance space that is also a lounge and a comfortable space. So it can transform lobby by day, club at night. It can have a variety of musical performances or there's a place to people hang out and work. I think because you want as, you, as your desks are getting smaller and smaller, people need other alternate places to work and can work in different modes. We also have been forced we got to work in exhibit work, as um, Carol mentioned. We sort of create um, stories. We turn those into places. This is the Walt Disney Family Museum. So we told, we got to tell the story of the greatest storyteller of the 20th century, Walt Disney. His accomplishments, his successes, his creations over his career. And this is the end of his last 18 years of his life where there was a profusion of everything he created. So we put it all together. There is um, his TV shows that were here. There's the um, Epcot, World's Fair, Disneyland. And so the, the stairway became an engine to tell the story. As you walk down the, st uh, not the, stairway, the, um, the ramp, it allowed you to go see the profusion of everything. So you walked into this gallery, it was like Christmas morning. All the presents were there. You can see everything um, all set out and sort of see the profusion of the last 18 years of his life. And the beginning of his life, you know, they talked about his early stories. And so each gallery was meant to resemble the period and the time. So we've made um, his personal stories, had wallpaper that was kind of um, indicative of that period with photos framed that can tell his personal stories. This was a first aid um, truck that he drove. And then here's different pieces. And because Walt Disney had hours and hours of TV and video and recordings of him, he became, which is really important in a museum, the voice of his own museum. He told his own story. We used his video, his voice. And so he was the voice and the persona of the series. The moment you walk in, he is telling his own story with audio overhead and then cartoons that, uh, that he gives. Um, here, as well as all the different elements. And we also did the Center for Civil Rights and Human Rights. This is in, in Atlanta. So it tells the story of uh, human, civil rights in the South from the mid-50s to 1968. And so it wanted to, it wanted to show how it was a very youthful movement. You know, like we all know them as kind of like they're aging. They're like a hall of fame. But when this happened, these were young people who went um, 
and demonstrated. This is um, the bus in Mississippi, and these are all the um, Freedom Riders. And so all the people went to, who came down to Mississippi and those people from the South, um, a number were arrested. So these are all their mug shots. And then here, the scene six, they can tell their story. And then the um, lunch counter in um, North Carolina, we create a recreation of that. And we wanted people to experience this. So you can sit down um, on a replica of, the, of this. And this is a, a piece behind a two-way mirror that comes and goes and moves in and out. The violence that they were subjected to. And so you put on a, uh, a headphones, and it's binaural sound, which is very dimensional. So it feels like you're in the space when you're listening to it. And there's, then you, you become one of the demonstrators, and people are yelling and screaming. And you put your hands down to kind of start the sound. And it times you to how long you can sort of stand and listen to this. Um, it, and in fact, so it gets all your senses. There's a little what we call a butt kicker. So as you, every once in a while, the stools have a little jolt here. So you, you really get to experience what it was like to be in an environment like that. Um, and because it's the South, and it's turned out to be a very emotional um, piece, there's a little Kleenex um, box that's been added to this. And we create places where people feel real emotion. This is um, connecting to the human, human rights section, heroes of the human rights movement, all in paintings, current human rights activists. This is the Hall of Shame, all the dictators that are kind of in a police lineup. These are the baddies, the ones who've, um, you know, a lot of atrocities. So it, there's both the kind of the good and the bad and the people working today. It also has the Martin Luther King archives. And so it features the exhibit of his papers and his archives that rotates every three to four months. We want to create like a chapel, like really a uh, southern chapel. So it's, hickory, it's a hickory-lined room. And then his quotes are engraved all into the side. And then cases here that you can look at and see his um, artifacts. And it wants a place that comes, it comes together. So both the, uh, the civil rights and the human rights galleries all end in the same gallery called Shared Accomplishments. So it wants to kind of tie the two together because civil rights is really part of human rights. And the stories are, are tied together. So these are a series of screens, tall screens, six screens that have a full animation and video that is sort of swells and brings the music. Because it's uh, uh, people, there's a lot of kind of heartbreak in the movements, but they want to show how people come together and create a community. And I told you we had a lab, an interactive lab, um, and where people, uh, we create these three-dimensional experiences. So it brings that spectral performance you know, into the world. This is uh, something, something we do every year at the holidays in Brookfield Place. It's like the Santa Fe, um, you know, the, the bags with lights in it, the luminaires. And so they're all hanging above you and in the, um, the palm court. And then you can actually, down in the, these spaces here, to determine the color and transform this the space above you. Uh, we also created this, which is at Cosmo, um, a casino and hotel. It has 420 screens. It was a very low compressed, we, ca we got the space already un under construction. It was a very low compressed lobby that didn't have, it was all in the dark. And the great thing about lobbies, you want to come in to experience something different at different times of the day. So we tried to replicate that with all the screens. So we wrapped all the columns in monitors. Uh, the floor is reflective, the ceiling is reflective. This is actually, then they're surrounded by two-way mirrors. So when the lights come on the, in the videos, the whole column comes alive or it can reflect. And there's a series of videos and anime, uh, interactives in the space. Um, we also did Google, Google Paris, worked with them on their interactives to showcase their collection of paintings and artwork they're doing. So it's an interactive touch, touch screen. Another piece on... Uh, where this is, how do you animate uh, the opening of an office building? So this is a piece that has a wind, a wind anometer that transforms this in a constantly changing collection. Some more pieces. And then they create some spaces This is the, that are immersive, and this is for the um, Museum of Feelings um, for Glade. We created sort of these kind of immersive spaces. We create this kaleidoscopic kind of environment where botanical flowers could come alive. 
And we also do a lot of pro bono work, as, uh, and one of them is a playground. Uh, David Rockwell really wanted to contribute back to uh, Manhattan after 9-11 and looked for a number of ways to kind of contribute. And one way he thought about was the playgrounds in New York City at that time were just were unimaginative and uncreative and why they all look the same and why they all, you know, kind of not about real play. They're just about kind of movement and moving around. And so we looked at, uh, spent two years researching, um, spending time with a specialist, um, getting familiar with play, um, talking to a lot of different people, and create a playground downtown. And what we ended up doing was eliminate all the play equipment that you might have typically, the kind of climbing, swings, and went instead for an immersive environment. There's about sand and water and all the senses. And so instead of the play equipment, we created um, loose, loose parts so you can make and create your own playground out of uh, blocks. So it kind of inspires your imagination creativity. It is full, both um, fine motor skills, gross motor skills. It encourages um, social play, collaborative play. And then the water, they bring all the blocks into the water. And they have, you know, blocks in a, and these different shapes. We want, we want the shapes to be about um, imagination to create shelters. And there's noodles. They can create different spaces. There's decorative pieces. And we probably um, then created these blocks that could be sort of transform any space into a play space. And we've probably seven different locations around the world that they've now traveled to. And we opened one in Brooklyn a couple of years ago. Same water. And then one of our DIFA Dining by Designs. Uh, the great thing about DIFA is that they come to us and they say, you know, usually we create our own space, sometimes we work with a collaborator, but it's, we use it as a design lab. Like, what are we intrigued by? What is, what is interesting? And in this case, we were intrigued by dichroic film and mirrors, and we thought about the American Southwest and sort of at dusk, what does that look like? And so we painted all the wood pink, and then with a dichroic um, surround, it's like a greenhouse uh, for, for cactuses and cacti and succulents. And then another year, we worked with Noel. And Noel produces furniture. We thought, wouldn't it be great to do the ultimate whiteboard room? So everything was, every space, every surface was whiteboard. The floor, the walls, the ceiling, this rolling track. Uh, even we drew on top of the, the table. And we had John Bergerman, a, an ours, come in in the afternoon. And he started drawing and took the space that was originally white and transformed it by the evening into this space where he covered every, every single surface and painted on the table and the plates. So it made it an interactive space, made it kind of transform from uh, the afternoon to the evening. He s spent some time drawing during the cocktail hour, so he could, you know, and then he changed into his graffiti coat, and then he participated along with everyone else. And the last thing I'll show you is um, product design. Uh, Carol mentioned I work in products. I think the, actually I came to Rockwell Group was to design products. I'd worked previously designing products. And the great thing about working both on projects and in products, you sort of get the planning side as well as the making the object side. So the objects make sense in terms of planning. They're not just something that looks good. And this was our latest prom, product that we just uh, launched in London. It's for Benchmark. One of the things we found is that you know, there's a new interest in well, well-certified projects. So this is all sustainable wood, as well as natural finishes. Um, and it's all aligned with um, well certification, well standards, as well as declare. So it, it talks about this life cycle of the product and what to do at the end of the life cycle. And there's a lot of high-low desks um, everywhere now. And, but they mostly look like the same kind of white um, standard <coughs> table. So we want to create a table that looked more like a drafting table, like a classic drafting table. So it's all wood. We've kind of hidden the, uh, the mechanism right here for the high-low. So there's a work table and a work bench. So you have a couple of um, this. We also work with Noel Furniture um, to create a collection. And they came to us like, could you think about what is, what is uh, needed for the workplace of today and tomorrow? And we brought our kind of our notions of you know what our DNA and our notions of hospitality, and theater and play. So that was our DNA that informed the whole collection. 
So we didn't look at the kind of desk and how you worked individually, but how people came together. And one of the key pieces was a lounge chair. I said, you know, we didn't have a piece. I said, every great lobby has a lounge chair, a wing chair, and it's really important to have that softness in work in workplace. The throw pillow, I said, we have to have a throw pillow. I said, it's just a throw pillow. I said, well, area rugs, throw pillows help create spaces that people are comfortable, people like, they give identity to spaces. So I'm happy to say we have a throw pillow. We have occasional tables. We have, it crosses six different um, categories. We have steps, bleacher seating. We have lots of tables. We have storage, lounge furniture. Um, it's sort of, it, workplace was transforming. You know, the sense of hospitality was already coming into it. We just gave a lot more options. You know, one of the keys, uh, you know, things that we needed, we liked. You know, we liked a drink rail in a restaurant. It's like when you go to a bar you always, where you put a, down a drink. You're standing, allows you to interact with more people. Um, you can be sitting, you can, some people can sit in, people can stand, you're all at the same height. High top tables, we've added those. Um, another collection, this is with Stellarworks. We were like, what, is pe what do people need for like the global nomad, the urban dweller? No one has space now for you know, a lot of stuff, so we created a compact collection that could fit and easy to move around and has little kind of touches, place for your remote control, a little leather pouch, you can sling, you can put it right here. Um, this is the sort of mix all, this is the um, high fidelity place to play records. Rugs, we get to work in rugs. This is uh, a collection with the rug company. This is the high end, kind of hand knotted to broad loom, so we get patterns on both, with both different collections. Concrete tile. Um, we also work in wall coverings. This is Maya Romanoff. And fabrics is our second collection with um, Jim Thompson. Um, hospitality based, you know, things that we love to have and bringing them with natural patterns and um, cut velvets. And lighting, this is with uh, Rich Billion Willing. Um, we did a lighting collection. We've probably done four different lighting collections with different people. And what are people looking for? This one is called Wit. So it comes in a variety of different cubes and balls and it can transform a space by kind of gri grabbing a, a larger area. And that's a kind of a, a survey of what uh, my work is. Uh, and what really, really it's about is like, it's not just you know, having projects, but all of them are opportunities. Opportunities to explore, to sort of see what the needs are and how do you satisfy those. Um, because really the, the good challenge is not to make it look pretty, but how to kind of make it appropriate and solve problems. So I'm open for questions. I think I've been incredibly fortunate. Um, you know, I started off as an architect. I, I, was, oh, I was an arty kid. I really wanted to do art. My dad said, ah, oh, you can't be an artist. You have to be an architect or you can make some money. And I believed him. So I, but I think I've always kept those sort of interests uh, tied together. And I've been fortunate to cover like everything from products to theater to exhibits. So it's really good. Well, you know, I, I didn't plan like a lot of things. I just, you know, any people came to me and said, would you want to do this? I would, like diff or anything, I would say, yeah, let's, I'm just as interested in the small project as the large project. Question in the back. The whole problem with banks is that people aren't using money, like cash anymore. So they're not going to the bank to take out cash. Um, <clears throat> and you took hospitality as a factor of making the bank itself a more interesting and desirable place to go. Mm -hmm. So did you guys actually notice any difference afterwards when you turned into this more cafe, hangout type of environment? Did you see mm -hmm. more people flocking to stay there, to seat there, to well, I we mean, even we, use the bank aspect? Yeah, it, um, actually we didn't transform too many existing banks. What, it, what the strategy was to go into states where they didn't have a, a branch presence and rather than opening branch after branch and branch, which is, used to be the method that people use to uh, start uh, checking accounts, they decided to create this sort of coffee, coffee space with banking attributes. So it's just light banking with ATM and associates. Um, it's hard for me to judge because, you know, post, you know, post occupancy evaluation is not something we get into, but we've done, they have about 30 of them around the country. They're in California, Illinois, and Washington State, Florida, uh, 
Massachusetts. So they continue to expand them. They see this as an opportunity to, enough of an opportunity that they, in fact, focus on a national ad campaign. So um, it's hard, it's, the only way they can really judge is, is there, are they converting people into checking accounts, which is probably a hard um, metrics to follow, but it's successful enough that they're continuing to open them and using it as a kind of feature. Because um, who wants to go to a bank? You know, only like when you're in desperate need do you ever in, end up at a bank. So it's a really kind of a new way and a new approach. And we wanted to make it look uh, as little like a bank as is possible. Um, uh, I just wonder, as an architect uh, in, or interior designer, how do you uh, cooperate with artists and how do you deal with technology? So the question is how do we uh, deal with, uh, cooperate with artists and deal with technology? Um, because we're sort of creating spaces that often tell stories and are sort of have narrative, you often want the kind of art artistic piece to be a part of that. We're doing an office place right now. We probably have, we uh, integrated an art consultant um, so that they can come in and we identified a number of areas. We kind of show like anything from wall murals to um, sculptures. And we gave them kind of like the parameters and let them kind of come up with their own solutions. So I think it's kind of critical, a kind of a critical process, like interesting and critical part of the process to include artists because they bring a different point of view and a different approach that you might, you know, not have. It looks more original and more different uh, and more unique. And also I think in your, at workplace, if you are, you know, looking and engaged in your screen all day, there's a certain part of your brain that's working. And then when you look up and look at artwork, it relaxes, your, your brain starts works differently. There's different neurons that are connecting. So it allows you to kind of think more creative and freely. So I think there's, there's kind of critical importance to the art. Um, so we, we uh, work with artists in a variety of different ways. We will hire an art consult consultant who might help us. We might have found it, like, uh, I just went to a, um, a street fair and I saw this artist, I thought, just took their information. So the next time we're looking for, um, she's a calligrapher. I thought she could be really good to create these sort of big murals with calligraphy. And then we also sometimes, we hired for um, downtown, the restaurant that we did uh, with Tao uh, Vandal. We found Lush as a street artist out of um, London and he curated a number of other artists to work with so that he brought the collection of artists so there was a lot of focus on art. And technology, I think, you know, we're all becoming adept and we're knowing like the kind of technology pieces and we're kind of thinking about it like the way we think about lighting from the very beginning and where are places for that, where do we incorporate it. We do have a, a lab that is dedicated to kind of um, this, so it helps keeps us informed. But then also with um, some of the exhibit work, we work with different technology groups. So I think it's just becoming part of our tools and elements that we add to it. And then we kind of looked like, where are we as a consultant? Do we work at in-house? Do we find a technologist who can kind of do this for us and give them some space? So I think you have to be just fluid and open to let, uh, uh, um, the process not be defined by like well, your uh, your preconceived ideas, but really what the collaboration will end up being. Um, I, no, I have a question about like uh, uh, you talk about a lot of uh, hospitality and experience. So, what's a different ways to achieve that goals? Like, I think it's not just for satisfy people's require uh, like wants and. What you otherwise like push them to do something? So, so hospitality and experience. Experience. Yeah. How do we push them? Um, well, you kind of think what their need states. What, what do they need? What helps support? It's much like theater. You. Um, it's not about like what you think looks good because often when we work, we decide like, oh, this will look great. Look how clever I am. Look at you know my great design. But how do you support people in that space so that they can feel like they it's their space? So you think about what, you know, sort of a lot of empathy, a lot about thinking about what they need, what they want. Um, and so it's really kind of, you know, looking, um, being really open to look around your own experiences and bringing them to that. But, uh, and sometimes you, you do give them something like more than the clients requested, like what are the real needs? Like, so you think about, so one is like we looked at social, you know, social mining to see what could be a new amenity in a, a, in a space, what people are looking for. Um, you pay attention to trends and say like, oh, this is kind of interesting, and uh, analogous programs. And all that kind of leads into questions like, uh, what a problem am I trying to solve? 
and then you know, come up with ideas. So I think hospitality is a method to think about that immersive, um, fully layered, everything tactile, everything you touch experience that is conducive to sort of like creating unique experiences. You are masters with lighting. I mean, everything is lit beautifully. And do you do it yourself? Do you uh, have lighting consultants? We never do anything ourselves, really. But lighting consultants. Uh, we have a lot of great lighting consultants. And you, um, it is amazing. When you put together a project, and you're, it's kind of coming together, the lighting consultant, when they're doing the final aim and focus, really brings the magic in a project. So lighting consultants are really key to any project. I think our, our success is we begin to think about the layers of light from the, from the very beginning. Um, it's not just, you know, where do you sort of integrate it? Is there going to be some cove lighting that adds this? Um, and you do think about layers, you know, is there a spotlight, the ambient light? What is a, you know, a task light? So that there should be multiple layers. When you turn a light on, it doesn't come from all one source, but it comes from multiple sources. And that kind of theatrical layering, um, I learned a lot from theater. Um, really helps with um, the total overall piece. And then you can work with the lighting designer because they'll have a lot more, more ideas. Um, but I think we've been sort of successful in that we kind of understand either intuitively or from our experience how to integrate the lighting and think about you know, what, are, what are the lighting elements that could, from the beginning. Because sometimes I argue, like, I don't want that you know, effect. I want something different, like some reflection. Um, so I think that's the, the key to it is like, what are the different layers establishing it? Um, what's up, where the light's coming from, cove lighting, up lighting, um, task lighting, decorative lighting. And the decorative lights, generally are the things that people look at and see as the element that thinks it gives light, but every, it really comes from all the other sources in the space. Well, it's always magical. Yeah, well, like the, I think it's actually some of the best parts of working in a project is the lighting. Yeah. All right, why don't we do one more question? Aha. Yes. Um, do you think, uh, in your design, the um, pragmatism approach uh, is bigger than the aesthetic approach, or the opposite? I think they're intertwined. It's really hard to separate them. I think uh, if it's totally aesthetic, then it's just what it looks like, and I'm not so interested in that. I'm more interested in, like, can it solve a problem? Can it help a you know, brand do something? Can it help you know, um, people feel better about what they do? Can it, um, you know, does it solve wellness? So I think it's always the practical and aesthetic intertwined and how to can make really how to make how to make it look solve some of those practical problems. Um, but it's not you know, one's not dominant. Even the places that appear really practical always have a lot of kind of design elements that could help with that. But I think our work, because it's immersive, it's has a lot of you know unique experiences, tends to look more about the aesthetics. But I um, my fortune is I I work on a lot of projects that are um, from exhibits to theater, and I really have to kind of think about, you know, um, what is like what is the story in a in, in a narrative I'm talking in, in the theater. I'm trying to support in the playground. How do I support children to be so they're creative and they're imaginative? And so it's not about what it looks like, but uh, truly what they can, how they can play and they live. Yeah. One more question: What's the next show we should all get tickets to? What's the next show? Mm. What do we have? Uh, we just have to, we have Tootsie. I have to say, well, Tootsie's a musical, and if you like musicals, it's great. But I think to, they tend to be a little formulaic. Uh, what are we? I think yeah, I, I would. Um, for me, I have to go, like go theater, like go off Broadway. I check everything out. Uh, rather than trying to like uh, focus on, even though we do the Broadway stuff, I think the interesting, like looking at artists that are different from yourself, looking at theater work that is a little different than your own, is probably perhaps more important than going to the next Broadway show. Right. But don't <laughs> tell him why I said that. And don't tell David I said that. <laughs> well, maybe everyone should get tickets to something in the shed. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.